Bobby Ward could not be with us today, so I get the honor of introducing our speakers today. We have two speakers this morning, both of whom are members of our rock Garden chapter and also friends of the J.C. Walston Arboretum. They are Cindy Cromwell and Nancy DeBrava, who will be speaking to us about a NARG-sponsored trip they took last summer to Yunnan, China, which is led by Panny Yodi Kalidas of the Denver Botanic Gardens. For those of you who are NARG's members, they and others on the trip wrote about their trip in the fall issue of the Rock Garden Quarterly, which included a large collection of photographs. And there are three copies of that Rock Garden Quarterly over there, if you'd like to peruse that after the meeting. Some really nice articles about different aspects of the trip. Cindy now lives in Cary, but is a transplanted gardener from Zone 5A in Connecticut in 2011. She's busy as a volunteer at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum, the Jennifer Lager Botanic Garden, and other horticultural organizations. Her new crevice garden that was installed by Jerry, Jeremy Schmidt is on tour for our members on March 23rd. Cindy is a member of the board of the Piedmont chapter of NARGS, and she is a candidate for the National NARGS board during the upcoming spring election. Her hobby? Killing a wide diversity of plants. <laughs> Nancy DeBrava retired last year after 18 years as a communications specialist at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. She has worked in various horticultural jobs in Florida, Kentucky, and Georgia. Nancy grew up in Florida and studied for a master's degree at J.C. Ralston, studying roadside wildflowers. Nancy's first year of retirement has been full of traveling, volunteering at the J.C.R.A., exploring natural areas, discovering new plants, and spending more time with her son, Graham. Their talk today is entitled, The Botany and Horticulture of Hunan, China. Please welcome Cindy and Nancy. Can I do the lights? When you're ready. Welcome. Thank you for coming this morning. I know it's a little cold. I'm going to give you just a little bit of background before we dive into the plants. Um, this trip took place in June of last year, and as she said, it was sponsored through the National Arts Organization. We just had enough people to go. There was 12 of us, six men, six women, the way it turned out. And we went for 18 days. <coughs> Basically, um, following in some of the footsteps of previous plant explorers, and that's one of the reasons Yunnan was picked this time of year. We picked the rainy season to go. A um, little background, Yunnan province, as you see, it's pretty close to really the Tropic of Cancer, is a little bit down below that. So there is a, a wide, um, this area along Burma is actually a tropical rainforest. And then the top here, which is right near Tibet, is you have glacial peaks. So the diversity is amazing in this, in Yunnan. Okay, just a little background. I know you've heard this, this is like a plant blitz place. It contains half of their species, plant and animal species that are in China. Uh, 18,000 different kinds of plants. That's all debated all the time. And these numbers go up and down. Uh, 7,000 endemic plant species, 30 endangered species. And like I said, the diversity is, is amazing. Two areas, two plants groups. This is the rhododendrons. They just be planted in, not planted, just growing in fields, unbelievable. Rhododendrons and prim primulas have really gone ballistic. And there's hundreds of species of each in the areas there. Now, our trip, uh, Basically, we started, I'll just tell you, we all found our way to Kuming, which is the capital of Yunnan province. This is a close-up of Yunnan, this, this light yellow area. We all found our way to Kuming, and then we took a plane as a group to Laijing, where, where you, you can see, I hope you can read that on there, it's just 320 miles to give you some perspective of how big this area is. We really started our trip, and our program will be about these three locations. Um, these are the cities. I've marked the cities, but Laijing is this whole area in, in between. So we're going to be in the upper end. Uh, just to give you an idea, Kuming was about 6,000 feet in elevation. Mm -hmm. So that's like our mountains here, the highest that we have. And then we gradually went up. You know, and we'd recover a little bit in the next one and the next one. So 
it was certainly planned that way. The first area is Lai Jing. And really, this was a, our first stop was recovering, getting a little bit used to the altitude and doing a lot of touristy things. Uh, they have a, a Nashi culture here, which is a woman doll. Oh, let me tell you, there's 26 different minorities. Talk about plants are diverse. There's 26 different ethnic, ethnic minorities in the country. They each have their own culture, their own costumes, their own language. And this area was Naxi, N-A-X-I, and that's a woman-dominated culture, believe it or not. They, they do most of the work, they have the businesses, they have the jobs. So we did a lot of touristy things, but I'll just tell you here, we did stop at uh, Joseph Rock's house, okay, which is being restored. He was one of the early plant collectors, was sent over from Arnold Arboretum, and lived there. He not, not only collected plants, he did, he studied the area. Uh, he's well known for, um, basically he's born in Austria, lived in Hawaii, got all the flora there, cataloged and stuff, and then was recognized and sent over. We spent many, many years there, and he's almost like a little, a celebrity of the past. And they're, it, they're changing it into a museum. This was his courtyard where he collected plants. So, but it was raining that day, and from there, we're gonna go to we have another now important plant. This, this talk's gonna be mostly about plants. This is just a little background. <coughs> Thanks, Nancy, for that background. It's, you can tell why she, she was the information specialist here. She's very good at all this. <coughs> Let me just see. So this is our first day of real botanizing. Unfortunately, it was our first and last day of botanizing in the rain, and our first and last day encountering leeches. This little guy doesn't look like it would do much to you, does it? It's about half an inch long in the cool <coughs> position, extending to about two inches. No big deal, right? And a few of the members of our trip decided to ignore the cautions to tuck pants and socks and apply DEET, and they ended up being injected with the anticoagulant that leeches inject you with, and bled for about an hour. Um, I guess I can tell you one of them was panioti colitis. <laughs> and you can see the engorged leech on the ground next to, um, I think that's Al Jirazi's shoe. We did um, have a wonderful day despite the challenging conditions. These are some anemone species we saw. <coughs> Cypripedium flavum, the first sip we saw. Frillaria serosa. <coughs> this was a clematis. Clematis chrysocoma, <coughs> adiantum species. I uh, saw so tons of this Erosema consanguinium, which I know many of you grow at home. It was supersized here. Um, and uh, kind of like to pop up from rhododendron bushes for some reason. There's Paniote pontificating. <laughs> and there's kind of an overview of the conditions. We were very wet. But it wasn't too cold, and people were thrilled just to be out looking at plants. Here's Matt Mattis, former president of the National NARCs, photographing what I think is the Lectrum Delavea. Here's Gelbenstadia Himalayaca. This is Paniotti's photograph. Drabo polyphyla. This is Derry Watkins getting a good look at the Cypripedium tomatigum. And it was hard to get a bad picture of that plant. It was stunning. Definitely the plant of the day. In Carvilia, Maria, um, we saw that in many locations, the really screaming hot pink. And this was the yellow form of Philictrum uninense. And there's the last picture from Leech Day. And you can see, despite the challenges, Derry in particular always had a huge smile on her face. And she's there in front of the viburnum species. Well, Road to Shangri-La, this is a little bit of uh, rebranding that's done. They're big, they're really big into tourism now, especially Chinese tourism. This area of Yunnan is, the air is clean, it's beautiful countryside, and a lot of visitors from China come. We were the only people 
really that we saw any Americans the whole time, maybe two or three others. So it's very popular. So this area has been rebranded by China as Shangri-La. And the province was called Zhongdian before. So they decided, and that's based you know, on the um, James Hinton novel, Lost Horizon. But what we did, um, this, is, this is the start of another day, and we're traveling to Shangri-La from Luijing. And I just wanted to show you some of the farmland and stuff. This is along the river basins. They grow everything. You know, this was here, well, everything that they can. This is, they have a lot of rapeseed. They have um, every kind of vegetable that we've seen in the market. Um, here, this is from the, the van um, in the River Valley. Their number one crop, though, is tobacco, believe it or not. It's everywhere, and probably a lot of the other side. And one of the things I wanted to show you, and in the field, so there's probably a little woman and a little girl, a lot of this is hand done. You know, there are trucks you'll see in the little villages, but a lot of it's still hand work. This is the first view of the Yangtze River, and the Yangtze River is, all these valleys are so important in this upper area. There's three parallel rivers, and the Yangtze is the third longest in the um, world. So we got a map here. It starts, it's 4,000 miles long, and it starts, just to give you an idea here, and it dips down into Yunnan, this is where we are, and then back out. It's huge, and it's very important of creating, you know, it's played a big role on these deep gorges and all, and there's so many endangered plants in these areas, and also provides all the farmland. It's, it's, it's big, so we're gonna take another look. We're going, um, Okay, so one of the areas, a little bit of touristy here, but um, it does have some of the deepest gorges in the world too, it's Tiger Leaping Gorge. This is still the Yangtze River. And looking down from the top, you can go down to see the rock in the center where the tiger leaps over and stuff, but it's quite a climb down. This is Cindy and, and Paniote coming down the stairs. And this is the, we're down the bottom now, you can see all the tourists over on the side here to get the size scale of this. <laughs> closest area the, where it's the narrowest, the Yangtze River, and um, so it's a little special area. But I wanted to know what goes down. I could get certainly get down okay, but to get back up, <coughs> I needed some help. And <laughs> <laughs> they have these guys, I forgot his name, and all uh, soliciting you, you know, at the top and stuff. And I, I just signed up right away for it. And, and actually, they carried me all the way up. And there's children and there's other people, you know, they're in their carts coming up. And this was about, it cost me only about $30. He was ecstatic. I mean, I don't know how much this was going to last me <coughs> for. You know, he was wealth. They were really wealthy on that amount. I felt really bad. But really, the real sweethearts with this the thing. Uh, down the road a little further, on our road to Shangri-La, it's another important area to see its first bend of, of the Yangtze, and I wanted to show you here is just a little viewing area. We'll see it in a minute. But um, this is the horticulture we had in the area. We peeked over the little viewing areas, and we had tomatoes were growing in these recycled urinals. <laughs> <laughs> here, little tomato plants were all. It was very, you know, it was good <laughs> and stuff. Chris pointed out they may already kind of have a little fertilizer to them. <laughs> I don't know. But this is actually a picture, I mean a picture, it looks uh, like a painting or something. This is the Yangtze River comes down and goes straight back up, you know, comes down from the north and turns back out of the country. These are like little teeny dots of cars to try to give you some perspective here. But um, it's hard not to miss that. Apparently it's not the cleanest river, like many of the rivers there, too. Let's just go on. This was uh, the plateau. Oh, there it may sound.
just wanted to show you, this is actually a roadside stop. This is it, uh, where they are, uh, at a little Tibetan village. There's a little pig running home. And in that field, which they need to stop at, a little special place, some of these plants just love this pasture kind of environment. We saw, we especially stopped for this one, Thermopsis barbata, which is beautiful clumps of it there uh, in bloom. And our Incarbilia was scattered about too, so we're looking at. But also, what was been fun with this one, well, the Iris decora was around, Stellara, but also the Drosera, Sundew. Cindy spotted it, and there's little sundews growing in that pasture up there. This one broke off, and somebody's holding it. This was one, and so you know, there's there's pigs, there's horses, there's <laughs> it's all there together. <laughs> so we're actually getting to Shangri-La. And uh, just real quick, I can't leave this out. A few slides on this. We went to they have the largest Tibetan monastery in Yunnan is there. There's seven to eight hundred monks and training lamas that are in the, the monastery. And we spent the day here um, just to, to see. These are little stairs where people are going up to give you the size of all this. There's like little people climbing up in here. But we did see a, we, there's a big lake in the front. And we walked around the lake and saw a few things. <coughs> right? We can't take any pictures inside. So okay, you saw it nice. This is our first little particularis which won't look like much compared to some of the later slides. I wanted to throw this in too. This is how it looks when it's growing, the Edelweiss. And um, it's just totally beautiful there on the hillsides. And a peaceful little walk up to the monastery, but it's full of gold statues and, you know, we could go in and um, <coughs> actually watch the monks pray. This was, we are all pretty mellowed out at the end of that day of coming out of the monastery. We found this little dog, this PK, Michael Dodge and myself. And Cindy, then, this is all the next day now. So this is our first day of real high altitude botanizing, and we did it um, the Westerners way. We took the gondola up to the top and walked down. <laughs> and uh, you can see the, the strong Tibetan architecture and the Buddhist prayer flags that were ubiquitous when we were there. I, I suppose um, they're tolerated by the Chinese government for now. Um, so Nancy is dressed for the conditions, which were um, cold, windy, and bright, bright sun. No leeches, no rain from here on out. It's a boardwalk that took us to the first place to go botanizing. We passed a Primula kyanantha variety Sinopropuria along the way. And I think um, Tim was pointing out those little teeny um, purpley flowers are probably also Primula. And this was the plant of the day, which we saw almost at the beginning. This is Heraclegia microphylla growing out of a crevice on the side of this rock face in these incredibly harsh conditions. Just a stunning, stunning plant. Spongia carpella was nearby. This is Spongia carpella unanensis, the yellow form. And here's where we're botanizing. It looks from a distance kind of stark, like nothing could grow there. But thank goodness there are a few special plants that are worth reward the effort going to find. There's Derry Watkins and Matt Mattis on the boardwalk almost being blown away that day. Mm -hmm. And there's PK and his good friend Michael Dodge, who's a willow expert, and was thrilled to find almost right away Salix Lindliana uh, in bloom for him. And I was thrilled to see the first really cool Corylus of the trip. This is Corylus pachycentra. Little Dravus species with white flowers. This is Androsaceae argongensis. This is an adorable little Primula Primula nanobella, which means small, beautiful, and it is. Pedicularis odori, anemone species. We're beginning to descend now. Um, this is a Potentilla species. So we're seeing more greenery. This is. Uh, Diapensia purpurea, kind of draped down the side of that ridge. This is one of the 
I only have a couple pictures of saxifrages, which it's a little bit of a disappointment. This is a photo actually by PK of Saxifraga andersonii. And here's the first of six million Primula secundiflora we saw. Planted itself near this um, purple roadie that's kind of midway through its blooming. This is uh, Sibaldia corporea. And here's kind of as we descended, you can see the roadies were just kind of ubiquitous everywhere. On the left is Marcella Ferreira, and way off in the distance is Scotty Smith, kind of exploring the area. And guess what Michael found under it, one of the shrubs, the first mechanopsis of the trip. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure this is Delaveo, but I haven't had that confirmed. It's a really cute Berberus. Um, you can see by the spikes it's a Berberus. The name of it is Stebritziana. And it has these lovely <coughs> pendulous flowers. It was really quite beautiful that day. As we descended, the conditions became more marshy. This is Caltha, enjoying those conditions. This is Caltha scoposa. It's a nice close shot by PK. And eventually, we ran into proper access roads and paths. And it was really kind of roadside botanizing on foot. You walked along and looked up. and done all kinds of great things. There's Scotty and Al up front, including this Loidea serotina, which was just adorable growing there in the crevice. So this is a natural crevice garden. And this is why we're all trying to copy, so we can grow some of these great plants. Primula polynura just kind of popped itself in between a couple of logs being used to retain the soil. <coughs> Clematis montana was kind of draped everywhere on the shrubbery. and. Uh, it may even be invasive in this environment, but it was quite decorative that day. Veratrum species. This was a salvia that PK grows in his garden in Denver, but he walked right past on this trip, so I enjoyed teasing him about that. This is salvia flava. This is an oriarchus um, spotted by Scotty Smith, who's an orchid, has written a book on orchids, so he's a specialist. This is Iris Bulliana. That blue is not photoshopped. It was truly that color. And we saw it in many, many locations. And when you get far enough down, there's enough vegetation to attract the yaks. And I'm pretty sure this is like Illyria amplexicollis, but I'm willing to be corrected. I'm not sure exactly what the large leaves are. The yaks in general were quite um, tame. They ignored us for the most part. They were quite busy eating. Um, this is the combination that was quite a knockout in many locations. The yellow is Primula sicamensis, and the purple is that Primula secundiflora again. And there's a close-up of the yellow sicamensis by PK. And as we got even farther down, we saw literally acres of the Chinese mayapple, Potophyllum hexandrum, with the flower on top where it should be, and this amazing variegated model foliage with incredible variation. I wanted to take them all home. That was a full day. And so we all, we, she didn't show the recovery shots. <laughs> of that, but, um, next day, so this, this day we're going to, we're still in Shangri-La area. We're going to do some roadside stops. We're going to go to Alpine Botanic Garden and then Napa High Lake for some more stops. So as we're driving along, of course, we see, see this. This is Cindy and Matt, Michael Dodge. And what we found in this little field was some Aquilegia rockii. It's very pretty. Uh, Iris booleana, Bully's Iris. And like she said, these aren't photoshopped either on these no, no mocaris asper. I think that was maybe one of the first places we saw it. This is a little lily that's probably two to three feet tall, and sometimes you get doubles on the branches, and it's striking, it's amazing. They're beautiful peeking out of the woods. We moved on to Shangri-La Alpine Botanic Gardens, which of course, like many, everybody claims there's something, the highest garden you know, in the world, but um, see, that's claimed by many. So here we have Rosa Prey Lessons, a Shangri-La Rose, which is very pretty little peak there coming in. And what you can see here, it's a very dry garden, uh, not a lot of natural looking, let's just say it's natural looking. And in the back, I just want to point out to here, 
this is, it's on the peak of, we're overlooking Napa High Lake here in the back, and we're gonna go, be going around this lake a little bit later today to look at things. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. <coughs> in the dry area of the garden, a couple of the cool things we saw, the Androsaceae, Bulliana, uh, Bully's Rock Jasmine, um, Rosa omiensis, the white rose. And then in the center, there's actually, of the garden, you go into a shady area and they have a little temple in there. And this was just some of the prayer flags that were there as Michael Dodge played around. But um, I think it's a very cool thing. But in the shady area, we, there was orchids all scattered among the grounds there. They're growing, like, starting to grow like weeds. This is a, just a cypripedium flavum, a couple that we saw there. Uh, and the Cypripedium Tibeticum, it's just beautiful. So it was a lot of fun looking for these things. So as we went back out, now we're getting ready to head off to uh, the, let me just tell you real quick, this is a seasonal lake. And um, right now, it's in the, it was in the, we're in there in June, so it's kind of in this marshy meadow phase where it's getting all the snow melt. And the rainy season's just beginning. Well, it'll full, fill up, the whole valley will fill up and be a complete lake. And in the fall, this is one of the key areas for migrating birds to come to. So right now, well, we'll get a closer look at it. We're heading off, okay? We hopped in the van, and off we go. And the first stop is a, maybe a dry hillside, because they spotted a couple things uh, here. And it was just a whole little field of Incarvillia marii. And we had a little blue thing that we quite, a, I don't know if we ever got that identified, but this is just to give you an idea of a, a drier little area and what we found. As we went further, see, here's, we were here, back in here at the Botanic Garden, and now we're going around this swampy meadow. Well, here are some areas are green. Um, we spotted this field of anemone and stopped. Now people went, I'll show you the anemone, I don't know which one, but all of those were as far as you could see, and then up into the woods coming up, beautiful, there's many anemone, they're all in bloom now. But as you, from that hillside, turning around, everybody continued up the mountain, and as I watched, and um, all down in here, everybody's kind of literally screaming and running around up in these <laughs> bushes. And what they found, it was full of orchids. Yeah. Cindy was up there. She said there's hundreds of orchids all up under the side there. And um, we had Uninense, uh, Flavum, and all kinds of, she had a lot of different pictures of the different uh, variations of these. These were the two main ones, though. But looking back, just tell you real quick about the upper lake. Uh, these were people bring their animals in down from the mountains to graze here on this green land. And it's, it's a reserve now, so it's not going to be destroyed. Um, they have horses, yaks are in the area, so we're going to bring them down our horses. And um, this is the last view of it. It's pretty vast. From here, special area. So the next day, though, was the end of that, and off we go just roadside stops on our way to Tanchi Lake. It was the end of the day, and we're in Jeeps now, too. I think this is where we just, we go from the bus to Jeeps, and I hired like five or six local <laughs> drivers that stayed with us the whole time. And um, this area, this is Scotty and Michael Dodd. This is literally around a roadside back down a dirt road, all these primula. I'll show you a closer picture. You see how they grow. This is totally kind of marshy, wet, where you're walking around. These candelabra type and primulus sycamensis here, all just mixed in. Growing those little. Um, Tanchi Lake, we wrote a little article about it in the Trillium, but I'll tell you a little bit more. When we got there, um, we first just stopped and had lunch in this field of azaleas before we took off. You turn around from the field of azaleas and you see the lake and another big marshy area. It's just amazing, these hillsides of the primulas. These are all the primulas again in here. We saw, I think this was our first Rhea Alexandri, an ornamental rhubarb. You'll see some bigger ones on the mountains. It has these yellow bracts that they have, and I think these are just actually little flowers in there. Flowers turn into seed. 
but um, they're usually held a little tighter and prettier. But this is all a big wet marshy area. Um, this is a green gentian, was it megacodon, is what I got from Florida, China on there. And um, they were just, I think, coming into bloom now. This is somebody tilting the flower on this side of these, of these big green flowers. And then we also saw they're back in the woods as we're going around the lake. The full bloom is a rhododendron bordii, which is totally unbelievable. Large yellow flowers <laughs> draping in the trees. Um, but um, mm -hmm. and you may have read the article in there. In local, Sydney and I got wet and stuck. It was cold. It was changing. The weather was changing. It was starting to rain and all. And we went back to the cars that were locked. And we got rescued by these <coughs> women who came up and had us. They couldn't speak any English. And they had us come to their little hut and warm up, dry off. And we eventually had a little tea party where the, <laughs> the rest of the people found us. <laughs> And they were really, what was neat, our little guidebook was just pictures in Chinese. They love seeing the, their plants that they live with in a book. <laughs> just the fact they're in a book. I mean, they may, it's just like, <gasps> you're just thrilled with that. It was just wonderful, the kindness and stuff. And that's Al having his yak butter tea he had made for us there. Um, this is just the last shot of that day. And we're heading home, but we're looking at where we're going to be going. The Hongshan Pass pretty soon with that. So continuing on to Hongshan Pass, um, as you can see, the weather continued to be propitious, and the views are amazing. This is where we stayed. It's about 12,000 feet. As Nancy mentioned, we're on jeeps. The roads are largely unpaved in this area, and the accommodations were basic, but adequate, good place to sleep at night, and um, food to eat, and again, the Buddhism is uh, quite present. These are some shots I took first thing in the morning. The mist coming off the mountains. There's breakfast. Matt and Michael, I mean, it, the, the breakfasts were delicious. I think both of them were suffering a bit with altitude and perhaps digestion issues that day. Um, there are these incredible evergreen oaks hanging over a um, snow-fed stream that ran back the guest house and draped with uh, moss. This is actually a natural hybrid that um, Paniote spotted out near the guest house. It's a cross with the blue iris bulliana that we've been seeing with the iris chrysographes, the black iris. And there was tons of this just um, scattered along the stream. These are some views from the Jeeps. And in Hongshan, the Hongshan Pass area, we weren't doing a lot of hiking as such. We were pulling over by the side of the road, running up the mountain getting our shots and jumping back in the Jeep. Definitely roadside botanizing. And you can see why we needed Jeeps. The terrain is quite rugged. Um, our Jeep drivers were excellent. And uh, here are, here's one of them on the left. This is Yang Adong, <coughs> who, if you look at the issues of the NARCS quarterly that describe this trip that are over on the table, he took the cover shot of Mechanopsis integrifolia. He shared a lot of his photography of Sichuan province. He's a botanist and photographer, and now I need to go to Sichuan. And um, on the right is Peter, a guide who was with us for much of the trip, and you can see their prayer beads on their wrists there. This is a Rogerisia, which, contrary to what I thought, does not need to grow in a bog. It can grow in a scree, evenly moist, well-drained soil, which we don't have. <laughs> but in these conditions, this, I'm pretty sure this is a Rogerisia esculifolia. This is Matt Mattis um, demonstrating the extremely long spadex appendage on this erysema elephas. Mechanopsis integrifolia. This is one of the first ones we saw kind of closed up here and then a little more open. I think that's I think that's probably damage from all the rain they've had. This is a cute little um, Loidia ix. Ixiolidioides, complicated name, but a sweet little plant. Here are the paparazzi surrounding an incredible corydalus, of course. This is uh, Corydalus benicincta, which has completely different foliage, entire leaves that are modeled probably to blend in with the 
screen. It was literally growing in a road with those amazing blooms. And our Jeep almost <laughs> crushed this one. The front wheels didn't get it, but I got a shot because I have a feeling that when we pulled out, it might have been gone. So continuing with the roadside botanizing, we literally pull over, run up the hill, and here's one of our drivers, Michael Dodge and Derry, all going for shots of Primula pulchella, Andrasa C. de la Veii. And um, eventually we ran and started running into real scree in Hongshan Pass. And here is Corydalus benachinta again. And this was that really cool lily with the fused petals, Lilium lophiforum. This is an unusual looking Corydalus, screaming yellow um, blooms and um, uncharacteristic foliage. This is Corydalus lunari dioides. It's a sedum relative, Rhodiola rosulata. So a lot of that high in the scree and full bloom. Arenaria polytrichoides, making mounds and cushions. And here's the, uh, the terrain we were searching in. It's, um, it's quite amazing to me that any plants grow here, and it was such a wonderful experience to see what does grow here and how amazing a lot of it is. That's Marcella, of course, out ahead of the pack. She lives in the Andes, so she can go higher. <laughs> this is our first Sosuria, which I think was probably Marcella's favorite uh, genus on the trip. This is Sosuria quercifolia, the little Draga unanensis popping in there. Mechanopsis herigula. Even the flower buds are covered with these scary-looking spikes. Mm. Slightly larger clump of Drago polyphyla grow, or Unidensis, sorry, growing in a crevice. And here's the picnic spot. There are no picnic tables. There is no vegetation to relax on. You just find your favorite rock and have your sandwich. That's Marcella, Nancy, and PK. And um, trying to use the pointer here. Here's here's the um, terrain we were tackling, and one of our group is actually there. Yes. We decide that must be Marcella, but uh, it's worth it. It looks like you're crawling up just to look at rocks, but there's cool plants there. You need to go. So this is, I scramble up following Marcella on, at this stop. And this, I call this boulder scree. It wasn't rock scree. I mean, they were huge boulders. It had to be at least five pounds to 10 pounds, some of them. Scrambled up somehow and finally saw this was the holy grail for many people. This is um, Rium nobile, noble rhubarb, and it has quite the, quite the form. It was just so stunning. I was so happy and proud of myself and feeling sorry for all the people lower down. And what do you know, PK found a better example right by the roadside. And there he is with young Adam and Dairy examining the anatomy of this incredible plant. How tall is that plant? It's over three feet tall. This is actually another Sosuria bodiniera. And as we descended, um, we found again these uh, snow melt fed streams, boulder spree, and popped in all along the way, of course. Got a count on Corydalus, Corydalus hamata. Really nicely marked flowers and characteristic kind of glaucous toothed foliage. This is Primula nanabella again by the stream. This is a cute little ground cover shrub called um, Cassiope. This is Cassiope um, selaginoides. Thanks, Nance. <laughs> Andrasis del Veii. Um, this is the Araneria polytrichoides again. And here's yet another room that loves to grow in the screen. That's my friend Scotty Smith with Rheum Acuminatum. This is Spongia Cartella, the purple form purpurea. And here's to close out the Yangshan, um, Hongshan portion of the trip. There's a, a nice little natural planting, Andrasis e del a few different colorways, a deep pink, a white, and pale pink with some anemone species, and at the bottom some um, some potentilla, I think that's Stilophora. And then it was on to uh, Baimashan, which is 
by far the tallest mountain range we went to. It's way up over 17,000 feet. I think our group reached, well, Marcella reached over 16,000. The rest of us were slightly behind her. This is a little shelter hut um, that the local people use to shelter from weather when they're out tending yaks. And again, it looks fairly bleak as you're driving along. Um, Buddhist influence. This is actually a parking lot at the base of uh, one of the ridges we explored. This is the town of Deccan, which is very interesting. It's completely new build. Um, might have been built since you were there, Elsa. I'm not sure if it looks different to you. or. But um, largely uninhabited buildings. Um, really interesting place, very different. I, it's clear the government has big plans for it. This is our hotel, which kind of reflects the Tibetan um, aesthetic. And here's the lobby with the famous gold sofa. Uh, here we are doing plant IDs at night. Uh, it's Jeff Wagner, Derry Watkins, myself, PK, Al Jarossi, and Terry Humphreys, all crowded around. There were massage chairs, and uh, so typical of these three gentlemen. He came with his nose in a book. Matt Mattis kind of pooped out, and uh, and Larry Klotz, who, if you um, have a chance to take a look at the quarterly for the fall of 2018, Larry wrote an incredibly scholarly article on the region and the botanizing there, and I learned a lot even though I'd been on the trip. There's a, this is the view from my hotel room. There's the school across the way, and um, they also had solar array, a solar array on the roof, as well as a garden, and there was um, Buddhist chanting every morning at 7. The yaks came by for meals a couple times a day. Um, these are the dumpsters right near our hotel, and uh, people would just leave food out for them, and I don't think they ever made it inside the dumpsters. They were just left on the pavement. And, Yaks enjoyed it. So it's kind of a forbidding landscape. I mean, you are in the Himalayas, and um, it's, it's really hard to believe there's anything up there, but there is, including some very tiny plants. This is the tiniest primula, the tiniest probably flower I saw on the trip. The yaks, as I mentioned, are very well behaved and so busy eating. But my friend Scotty did not know how close that yak was to him. So I said, look over here, let me get your picture. And uh, it's kind of cute. This is um, another amazing corridolus. Um, this is corridolus calcicola. This is a very showy astragalus unanensi. This is just the top view of a primula canamantha variety sinopropuria. Just thought it was interesting to see the flower structure on that one. This is, um, I think this is a Particularis densa spica again. And this, I just threw this shot in to show you there's such a clear division. You're kind of walking along, there's shrubbery, there's greenery, the yaks are hanging out with you. And then all of a sudden there's such a clear line and this is where we look for plants. So um, it doesn't show you there is a ridge. We didn't go straight up. We came across, but it's um, very loose scree, moving scree. If any of you saw Voitex talk, that's what it was. It was moving scree. So challenging, but so worth it. This is a saxifrage variety. I still don't have an ID on it. Um, this is um, again the Crinolus calcicola. And my very favorite, Corydalus melanochlora. The um, foliage is great, the flowers are great, it's growing in boulder scree. What more can you ask for? Um, and I hope you all recognize this one again. This is Paraquilegia microphylla. And I have three different clumps, three different exposures, and you wouldn't, you could hardly believe they're the same genus species because um, some are more exposed to wind and sun. Some have more flowers. And this one had really um, happy looking foliage, but not nearly as many flowers, and it was in the shade. So, Surya Medusa, um, 
really cool sausuria. Unfortunately, the indigenous people harvest the sausuria for herbal medicine, and it's endangered for that reason. This is not a sausuria. It, this is actually a reseeding um, annual herb called Fluorospermum. I just thought it looked really cool. Well, this is um, Curtilus melanochlora again. You can see it has that color changing habit, kind of like a Virginia bluebell. The blooms start out as that pretty blue, and then as they age, get the purple one. So this is all one plant. And I just wanted to say a few words about the NARGS National Organization and urge you to consider supporting what they do, subscribe, um, joining so you can get the amazing articles about places that maybe you're not going to be able to visit, but also participating in this wonderful travel program. I could, this was, it's sad to say, this is one of the happiest moments of my life. <laughs> I'm at 15 and a half thousand feet. I've seen curls I never thought I would see. And I kind of got drug up by some friends. I, I wanted to quit, but I didn't. And uh, you'll never forget that experience. And I think Elsa would agree with me on that one. And um, just think about doing it. Take a risk. Take a chance. And, and support our national organization, which is putting these trips together so that regular people can go out and see some of these amazing things. <laughs> We're getting to the end here. This is Matt Mattis again. And I think you get a little high, too, at these high altitudes. You know? You're a little lightheaded, and everybody's happy. But you know, and, and, and Matt, this is Matt with one of the primulas. What's his Kyonantha? Here, that he had up there. But one of the things I did want to say, put this in to remember, we, didn't, we just took pictures. We didn't collect anything. And I think you know, one of maybe our group had like a rock, a souvenir rock, you know, in their suitcase, and that got confiscated. So I mean, and even in the first part on Leech Day, they had a ranger there, didn't they? When we came down, that was kind of lurking around, making sure nobody's collecting. And um, you know, customs was another thing because coming in, we were all fingerprinted, and several times, and we were being filmed most of the trip. Man, uh, I can tell you about that another time. So. It was just like you said, a great trip. We're all a little high there from the altitude. This is by, this is that field of anemone near Napa Lake. And a shot of the group that we had, I guess the Chamberlain. Well, I told you we had a local guy, we had one woman that stayed with us. She's, I don't think she's even in this, Carolyn. Um, maybe you heard some of us say, Carolyn introduced herself by saying she's married but available. That was one of the first introductions that she had. But she was she was great. I, she was fine. She stayed with us the whole time. But at each town, we had two other people, and these are the jeep drivers too that put up with us and all the bouncing. Oh, I having worked with signs, I have to put a sign in. And this was at the monastery, you know, and they had several signs. Just please treat the environment with kindness and care for nature as we went along the little trail. And I really thank you all for coming. And if you have any questions, I... Oh, you said too, Chris said probably by the end of the month, you know, he's filming these, and if you go to the Arboretum's webpage, all, first page, all the way down the bottom right in the margin, you can go to the YouTube channel, click on a little YouTube, and you can see all the programs. So, so if, you, if there was a particular plant that you wanted to look at again, they're all there. Are there other questions? Do any of these plants grow in our area? Say that again? Oh, do they grow in our area? Your answer was no, right, <laughs> Tony? Not the high elevation. Huh? Not the high elevation. The lowest elevation we were at botanizing was 10,000 what about the uh, candelabra type primulas? Still, it's not cool enough. Okay. <coughs> you just got to drool. It was just had a. So you can see. It's one horticultural zone where you're dealing with there. Say? Horticultural zone. How cold did it get? Oh. Well, I know in Kuming, which we started, okay, they only, the, they're high, like in the summer, is about 75 and it goes down to maybe zero there. 
And there, there was bougainvillea and different, a lot of tropical sort of plants there. And now up here, I don't even know. Do you have any it's idea? I mean, it's usually covered with snow, Tony. Kunming is a zone nine. Is it? So okay. It's, it's very tropical, but it never gets very high. So it would be like a, a west coast zone nine. So that's the problem. You can't compare it really to the east coast. Lijiang was <coughs> around the zone six, seven. When you get up to zone D and you're zone five. Zone five, up there on the top. Yeah, the last count she showed you that she said was mostly empty, that's 80% Tibetan that lived there. We were unusual in the area. You know, they were, uh, got a lot of looks coming in. <laughs> 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 Tell us about some of the food you had. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Cindy's frowning. She had a heart. <laughs> yeah. Um, so <coughs> All of you who know me at all know I'm, I kind of, I don't have rice and whoops, cookies and all that stuff. And I was surprised at um, how hard it was to get adequate protein and how much they relied on cookies and crackers and noodles for their nutrition. And so that for me, that was challenging. There were some delicious meals. And I have to tell you, yak is tender and delicious. So yeah, you have an opportunity pork. to have some yak. I found that quite tasty. No eggs? We had a lot of hard cooked eggs, which was, um, I think, a concession to me. Thank goodness. Yeah. yeah. You didn't see chicken around. You saw pigs around. I mean, I think before dinner, I saw somebody carrying a pig toward the table. Yeah, there was pigs everywhere and the yaks. I didn't see chickens around much. I don't know. I guess they keep them up so they don't get eaten by things. But in the morning we'd have like, a, we stayed at some of the nicer hotels and it was a huge buffet, Chinese buffet of noodles and all kinds of vegetables. You can put in your noodle soup. They'd have it like that and you can go to all kinds of green things, onions and this and that, right. But they had, and you could get eggs there. They'd make mm -hmm. eggs and they'd have coffee. And they'd have a small little American thing of like, of kicks or something. <laughs> <laughs> Cereal, right? that, little, that little area. And, and fruit, mangoes, or mangoes are real good. But we'd make our lunch every day from this other kind of cheaper stuff. That was hard. We had a couple nights we, we ate at some very, very nice restaurants. It was a hot, yeah. hot restaurant, especially in Shangri-La, which is the big um, tourist town, even mm -hmm. though we, we were basically the only Westerners walking the streets of Shangri-La. So that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are the yaks just domestic animals that are ranging Free? They're free range yaks. I mean, and uh, from what I can tell, like those ladies at the hut we ran into, mm -hmm. you know, they're they're all belled. So they obviously maybe come back for additional fodder or for protection in the winter because but uh, they were so placid and they've got these big horns and they look scary, but um, there was one incident I heard though, Marcella yeah. apparently challenged one of them and it kind of hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, back back or, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they just graze on all that natural stuff that they make really, they make a lot of yak butter and cheese out of it that's really rich in all kinds of nutrients and stuff. Can you pull up enough adjectives to let me experience yak butter tea? Mm. I thought it was, it reminded me of chicken broth. Oh. It was uh, very it, salty. It was salty. Yeah. yeah, it was salty, probably from, they have a lot of salt they put in things. But it was the yak butter tea that, that I had that day was was rich. It's like if you put butter, really heavy duty butter. Well, she churned the butter yeah. first. Remember she yeah. had her little churn? Butter blended in tea with salt. <laughs> and it was a tea that stewed all day. It was a special tea that had been stewing all day. Make it very concentrated. It was a health drink. <laughs> The fellas ate a lot of barley. Um, they'd make this barley paste concoction. The guy, the Jeep drivers, they'd have their little brew and they'd, they'd make like a barley paste. They'd eat a lot of barley with butter. So you recommend So don't, if you have an offer, I know it's, it was a challenging time of year. Getting there and getting back was challenging. The culture was challenging sometimes. and didn't always have perfect comfort, but who cares? It was an unbelievable trip, and you just need to go if you can. <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you.